All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Paul Hornbeck. I'm a senior planner with the town of Windsor. We've got a, a wonderful consultant team with us and, and you'll meet those individuals as we progress through the night. Um, a quick kind of programming note, we are covering the Walnut Street project tonight and there was a little um, mix up in our messaging. So if you happen to be tuning in wanting to see the 7th Street project, we covered that last night, uh, but it is available on the town uh, on the project website, windsorprojectconnect.com. Uh, um, so with that, we can go ahead and get started tonight. Um, so we're gonna give you a quick overview of the project and then we'll really get into the meat of it and look at the designs we've come up for Walnut and then do some quick polling at the end to get your thoughts. So if, you've, uh, if you were with us last night, you, you saw this schedule and it's the same schedule for 7th and Walnut. We kicked off this project in August and uh, launched the website, started um, working on goals for the project. And through September and October, we came up with a toolkit of different design options for Walnut Street. And starting in November, December, we had these community meetings to start um, gauging the community's input on the existing conditions and goals, making, sh making sure we were understanding the, um, the reality of Walnut Street. And earlier in uh, December, we previewed some of the early design concepts and now tonight we're gonna um, reveal some of the more, more refined concepts that we've come up with. And then the 25th of this month will be before town board with a work session to hopefully get their thumbs up approval to really proceed with the more um, technical design engineering. And then hopefully we'll begin to see some work done on Walnut this, uh, this summer. So the, the reason we're looking at Walnut Street is uh, one, it was identified in the town's transportation master plan, which was adopted last year by town board as a key uh, bikeway for a, a low stress bike connection in town. And Main Street is really kind of the life, uh, lifeblood of, of Windsor with so many, um, you know, we have the high school, middle school, downtown grocery stores everything you really need in town is located off of main street and ideally we would have a bike corridor along along main street but it it proved to just be um, too many obstacles to to accommodate bikes given the amount of traffic the speed of traffic and being a state highway so that's why walnut was identified as a uh, really a parallel route that's for much of it is just one block off of Main Street and offers that uh, lower stress, lower traffic, lower speeds uh, route for bicyclists. And another, another reason we're looking at Walnut is it's really um, kind of intuitively right off downtown. It's one of the more pedestrian friendly areas of town where um, we do have a lot higher pedestrian activity and, and the mass transportation master plan uh, identified that, recognized that these were priority areas for, for making improvements. So we'll also be looking at things to kind of slow traffic and make the pedestrian experience better as well. So we've done a lot of outreach, trying to get you all and, and others input on this project to make sure it's um, a project that meets your needs, the community's needs. Um, in the, in the neighborhood's needs. So next slide. So we did do some polling at our last meeting asking if, or the previous two meetings, asking if our data on the existing conditions matched your experience. And the predominant response was, it, yes, it reflects a lot of my experience or yes, it matches um, some of my experience. So that, uh, next slide, please. And then we also asked, do you agree with the uh, goals for the corridor? And again, predominantly yes, or, or agree with some of them. And then we also did 
the question on what should be the top goal for the, the project. And, and that one was to introduce safety features that enhance neighborhood character and improve efficiency for bicycling with the, the other two goals um, not far behind either. And we also did some online polling that uh, reached over 450 Windsor residents um, that maybe aren't engaged in these meetings as much, um, but we still wanted their, their input on the project and, and asked them similar questions, asking them if they thought the team explored enough uh, adequate number of options for Walnut Street and a little over 70% said yes to that. And as we'll talk about, um, there's a, a basic concept and an enhanced concept that um, really comes into play more for 7th Street, but um, there are some components of that as well for, for Walnut Street where there are some improvements that are more kind of quick quick wins while others are more maybe long-term investments in, in concrete and things. And so the basic uh, improvement, it, the general consensus well, around 80% was that it, it did look like a reasonable design. And then for the, the goals, those are, are really focused on a safe east-west bicycle connection, reducing crashes at intersections, and then also some traffic calming to reduce speeds and traffic. And I mentioned the toolbox, so that's really just a wide range of possible uh, design options that could be implemented in the corridor. Um, our team looked at you see this long list here of, of different options and as kind of by process of elimination of, of what's what works and what doesn't for this particular corridor, um, I've narrowed those down to what you'll see tonight. And so finally, as I mentioned, basic and enhanced design concepts. The, the timing for the basic is something that's addressed um, a more immediate fix and <clears throat> is really not a long-term fix necessarily, uh, but it can be quickly implemented at a lower cost, while the, the enhanced design would potentially be phased over a longer period of time. Uh, similar with funding and maintenance, uh, both would come from the, the town's capital budget with a, a larger enhanced project, possibly requiring some outside grant funding. And maintenance also potentially needing some new maintenance um, equipment or staff with an enhanced design. Both would require ongoing education enforcement and uh, evaluation. And so we do have money budgeted for, at a minimum, the, the basic design in, in this, this year's budget. And the more enhanced design, uh, there's no money budgeted yet, but that's something that can be looked at in the future. So I think we'll, we'll pause there for a moment for, for any questions, and then we'll, I'll turn it over to the design team to uh, share what they've come up with with you. And I do want to mention there's the, there's the chat function. So if you have questions, please do um, type those in. And there's also a pull down when you, when you do that chat function. And um, we'd prefer if you could do it to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your questions and uh, we'll try to get those answered. Great, thanks, Paul. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carlos Hernandez. Uh, my firm is CJH Planning, and I'm a transportation planner uh, working with the town on the project team. So you'll see me uh, two points tonight. I'm going to help with the uh, polling questions and um, some of the, the mechanics of the meeting, and I'll be talking about one part of the design. Uh, what I wanted to do first is just make sure, like Paul said, that what we're going to do tonight is make sure we interact with you, and the way that we're going to interact with you, the audience, is through the, um, the uh, chat function. What we're going to do is take a couple breaks during this. So we're intentioned to be done by kind of 8.15, but we're gonna present in segments and allow you um, to write in questions or comments. We'll respond to those at the time when we take those quick breaks 
what we wanted to do is focus on the presentation and the content so you don't get so engulfed in writing up all of the chat that you miss kind of some of the parts of the presentation. So uh, we can we will promise to try to get through as many as we can. If you've been to one of these before, you know we try to do as much as we can in this session so it's interactive. If there's something we can't get to, of course, we'll follow up. Uh, what you see on your screen out there in the world is uh, the project website. If you go to Windsor Project Connect, you'll see this. And this is 7th Street. And Paul mentioned our meeting last night. Uh, it was recorded. It'll be here in the morning. You'll just scroll down. You can take the survey again, if you or not again. You can only take it once. Um, the IP number is is tracked so that you don't you know, take it multiple times. Uh, but you could take it if you haven't. And then also um, this meeting that we discussed last night that we had, the link will be right here. So you can find that there. All right, so um, we're gonna jump into Walnut Street. What I wanted to do first is um, do a poll with you. You've seen these before, if you've been around, I'm gonna launch this right now. And uh, this gives us a sense of kind of where we maybe need to fill in some of the blanks um, about whether you've participated or not. And also gives us a sense of who's here from what areas. So first question is what describes your interest in the project? Do you live on Walnut? Do you live kind of like in the area of Walnut or you just live in Windsor? Maybe you operate a business nearby? or something else. And then um, the second question is, have you attended one of these e-meetings before? So that was, helps us uh, kind of understand um, if with the, some of the mechanics of how we present this information. Uh, and so while you're doing that, just a reminder that we had, our first meeting was existing conditions and goals. Our second meeting looked at preliminary designs, got some feedback, and now our third meeting is kind of refining those. So if you're interested in like, how many traffic counts are on certain places or how many crashes or details of that nature you wanna go back um, to the October e-meetings. If you're interested in how we got to this point in the, the design, you wanna review the December e-meetings. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and then I'm gonna share the results. And Alicia and anybody out in the uh, audience could you just let us know that you're seeing this so we know it works, great, Alicia works. Um, so, uh, okay, so a lot of you live in the area well, six of you live in the area. Uh, three of you are living on uh, Walnut Street. So it's great. We have some Walnut Street residents. And then, um, great. So many of you have attended an e-meeting before, so you know the drill. All right. So that'll help when we come to the polling. So I'm going to stop sharing that. And I'm going to turn uh, the presentation back over to Alicia. Make sure to get the screen while I, you're seeing the question slide here. So we're going to move on to the kind of the concept uh, designs here. Um, I'm going to go through each one of them. And as Carlos mentioned, feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll um, talk about them in intervals. But the number one, oh, let me go through existing conditions first. This is Walnut. You all are familiar with it. You know, we're basically through um, downtown area and uh, all the way out to 15th on the west end here. Um, I have two cross sections here. And if you imagine you're standing on the road um, and looking to the north, that's what these look like, or sorry, looking to the east, that's what these look like. Um, on the east end of the west end of the corridor here, um, it's residential and it's a 40 foot roadway width, which allows for one travel lane in each direction. So one car lane in each direction and then a parking lane right against the curb and gutter. And then on the east end of the corridor, it gets much wider. Um, we have more curb line in between the sidewalk and the curb and gutter. And then we have a parking lane, which is a very wide parking lane. In some locations, it shows kind of a, a faint second, um, you know, white line for a little bit of a bike lane. And then in some blocks, it has diagonal parking and in some it doesn't. We'll talk about that more to come. Just some um, photos to, remind you all what it looks like. I'm sure you drive it every day. But this one is Walnut as we're kind of approaching 10th Street. You can see that this is, um, you, you can start to see those stripes on the, the east side of 10th Street that kind of denote a little bit of a, an old, old, older bike lane and then um, crosswalks at 10th Street. Walnut approaching 4th Street here um, is familiar to you all, and this shows that really wide parking lane um, with this uh, Windsor Gov car actually in, in the parking area. 
and one lane in each direction. So key features of this design that I'm going to present to you are kind of focused around, we tried to obviously aim at the project goals. Um, the project goals are, you know, focused around safe, improving safety, improving comfort along the corridor. And then one of the goals spe speaks specifically to providing, you know, a bicycle facility um, in the area. And so our features here talk, look at those safe intersection crossings and then what type of bicycle facility will work best um, for everybody involved. So the number one thing about this corridor when you're thinking about intersection safety is that intersection crossings are challenging on this corridor because it's a lower volume corridor and you're crossing higher volume roads generally. Um, and so folks on foot and on bicycle and even in cars should be able to cross those comfortably um, where appropriate. So on this 11th Street one, we thought about a lot of different things on this one and ended up landing on this where it looks very similar. We'll talk about the striping in a different, um, in a different uh, slide, but right now focus on these raised median islands. This would probably look in the enhanced version like a raised median refuge where a pedestrian going east or west could you know, leave the curb and go on the asphalt and then stand on this curb uh, in the middle, a protected island in the middle um, in order to be able to cross one direction of traffic at a time. In the interim, it would probably look more with what we call 24 month trial materials where it's a little bit more paint and temporary materials. Um, so the big thing on this one was we did talk about some different configurations to make sure that we're slowing cars down, we're creating traffic calming, and this one actually creates traffic calming on 11th, as well as providing those amenities on Walnut, um, and you know increases yielding on as you're crossing on Walnut. So it just creates a safer, more comfortable intersection. As we move east in the corridor, there's some wide, the road widens, there's some wider locations that need a little bit more speed control in order to make this kind of the roadway that that people want along here, um, particularly in locations where people are crossing. And in this location, it's an un, we call it an uncontrolled crossing, which just means a crossing in those locations where there isn't already a stop sign for the people who are crossing to be protected. Um, this location, you probably, some, some folks here may be familiar with, we're calling this the you know, Century Senior Housing here. Um, we actually spoke with a 91-year young resident here um, who called and kind of helped us understand the feeling of crossing here and some of the concerns along this curve. And two of the concerns were just that it doesn't feel comfortable to cross there. People are going too fast through here. And also it's really hard to see down the road where folks are crossing or where cars are coming. So can. if you're a, here, I'm going to pull up a um, color here. Yeah. If you're, if you're a pedestrian and trying to cross going to the north side of the road here and a car is coming along in the eastbound direction, right now there are, you can see this parked car here. So if you're a car here, you can't see that pedestrian until they're way out into the roadway. And so one of the things we wanted to do was provide that refuge so that um, folks could make it across one direction before they go on. Um, but also in order to provide that refuge and to improve the safety really by necessity, no matter what you do on this curve, um, we're showing the removal of a piece of the parking um, along this side. In order to fit everything in there, we've also shown removal on the north side of the roadway there. Um, but the biggest, the biggest thing to consider here is on the south side of the roadway, if you're going to have a pedestrian crossing where there's currently one right now, it's important to be able to see far enough, and we call it stopping sight distance, basically so that car can stop before they get to the pedestrian. So this refuge island promotes speed compliance along Walnut um, anyway, and it also creates that safer crossing for pedestrians. Let's see if I can clear my drawing here and move on. Seventh and Walnut, those of you, I see a few of you are here from um, last night as well, and this will sound pretty familiar to all. Um, we've given you a little bit of a different view on 7th and Walnut because it's more what you would look like coming along Walnut. But the goal of 7th and Walnut here is this is one of our highest injury crash locations of all the intersections we studied. And so the goal here is really to provide a safe crossing location, but also just improve the safety of the intersection all overall. 
And one of the ways we do that is by clearing up and clarifying the turning movements and the potential conflicts between those turning movements with other cars, with pedestrians, with bicycles. And one way we do that is by providing a refuge island that only allows particular movements. And those particular movements are, are well thought of. We can get into it a little bit more later, but based on we um, some of the movements that are no longer gonna be allowed are those that have the lowest volumes currently. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a rundown on that in a second. But they do reduce those turning conflicts at this high crash location. And in general, it's just a goal to make it a safer, more comfortable crossing as well. So as far as, we'll get back to our marking here. As far as those movements that are still allowed, I'm going to do some work up here. Still northbound and southbound through. The right turns, all right turns are still allowed and right turns off Walnut are allowed. And here's the one that we get the most questions about. Left turns off Walnut headed into town and left turns off Walnut, this actually had a pretty high AM count, are allowed, okay? So those are all the movements from a vehicular perspective that are still allowed. The ones that currently are out there that are no longer allowed are if somebody wanted to go straight across in either direction, or catch up computer um, to go north or south. So the red ones in this mess of lines are no longer allowed. And the cool thing about this diagram is that it shows you where any of those lines conflict, red and green are the locations where there was a potential crash to start with. And once you take off that layer of red lines, um, you can see that there are quite a, quite a bit fewer crash potential locations. So one more thing I wanna show you here is bicycle and pedestrian movement. If you're in a bicycle, on a bicycle, you're in this lane, which I'll talk about in a minute, and you cross over and then you're no longer conflicting with any vehicles. You stop here, wait to uh, wait for um, Seventh Street traffic, and then you have a refuge island, and you can move on onto your bike lane. From a pedestrian perspective, you're using a bumped out or a curb extension area, which gives you more space and shortens the crossings in all directions. And to cross Seventh, you also have a refuge area, and you just cross across. Okay, so welcome to ask more questions on that later, but hopefully that gives a primer on um, what we're looking to do here at 7th and Walnut. And this one, as far as basic and enhanced, the basic would look at some of those temporary materials while the enhanced um, would be kind of more into this uh, raised configuration uh, that you see in the photo over here. And that photo shows another example of a location that actually allows pretty much the exact same movements that we're talking about here. It, involves, it allows lefts off of what we call the main line, which in this case would be seventh, but doesn't allow, allow those through or left movements off of the side street. Moving on to the east and thinking about those safe intersection crossings, um, at sixth and at third, we talked about what's the most important thing in this area, and we hear a lot about speed concerns through here. And we also hear some about crossing, but we wanted to make sure that we could put something in that would um, you know, help with that traffic calming effect through here. Um, we heard that fifth and fourth have big, uh, you know, while we're out there, you see those big gutter pans crossing the road and they kind of actually slow traffic naturally. And so these would do that at the um, adjacent intersections to those. And these two are shown um, we, they're called curb extensions, and you can see in the top picture, that's what those temporary materials I keep talking about might look like. Whereas maybe in the longer term, in the enhanced version, um, the, the bottom materials here with curb and gutter, uh, they may look like that. So it narrows the roadway visually to promote that speed compliance, and then it also reduces the crossing distance to create safer space for pedestrians, and it makes your downtown more comfortable. You may be thinking, you know, it talks about that interface with those higher volume streets with the intersections, um, but what are we going to do along the corridor to help those more multimodal users that um, one of the primary goals was about. So from a bicycles perspective, we go back to the west end of the corridor. We've looked at quite a few options for this um, 
for this piece. And we landed on one that has been done in other locations. It's certainly, um, you know, not something that Windsor has seen before, but actually this roadway meets the exact, you know, volume and speed criteria that, um, that apply to something called an advisory bike lane. Um, this little left graphic here is just a graphic that shows you how, how to use it. Um, and I, I'm happy to go through that at some point, but basically the cars use this middle space in between the dashed lines and the bikes use the space that looks like a traditional bike lane, conventional bike lane. And then if the cars are, you know, come up to another car that's opposing them, um, just because it's a little narrower than the typical roadway, they may put their right wheel over into that bike lane once there's no bike lane. So this type of, um, this type of bicycle facility has the primary benefit of it's, it's a traffic calming type uh, treatment, whether or not there are bicycles there. And it also allows us to keep the parking along the whole corridor. It gives more visibility to the people on bicycles because it moves them out more into the roadway where they're um, visible to cars. And like I said, no parking changes. And this little cross section here just gives you a feeling of, you know, if you were standing on the roadway, what it would look like. I'm going to turn it over to Carlos, to talk about the East End. Can you go back to the last slide for just a second? Mm -hmm. So this treatment is like 15th to how far east, Alicia? 15th to just past that century curve that we were talking about. Okay. It's just, just uh, west of 10th Okay, to Cottonwood Drive. So the reason why this one's so appropriate is because there's not enough width curb to curb to fit a buffered bike lane, keep the parking, and have two normal wide travel lanes, right? So the idea was, how do we keep the curb so we don't spend a lot of money that we don't have? How do we keep the parking? And then how do we safely get bikes in there? And then a side benefit is, how do we get people driving closer to the 25 mile posted limit? So so a lot of eggs going into that blender or a lot of you know tequila going into that margarita and how do we get the proper blend, right? And so this one was really a great solution to that. And um, and then I'm gonna talk about the um, two or three blocks that are uh, challenging. So now you can go to the next slide. So this corridor from 15th to 1st Street is 1.7 miles. And like any good project, uh, planning project, transportation project you work on, it's, it's a couple pieces or blocks that are going to uh, drive a lot of conversation. And, and we're ready to talk through these tonight with you. And when we don't take any of what we're going to tell you about lightly, um, but we want to make sure that we're transparent because I think you want to, I think you want to build trust in us as we go ahead that we're telling you everything that's going on. So I'm about to tell you that what's going on. So 1.7 miles of this is really easy. And Alicia showed you the um, advisory bike lane, basically from 7th Street to like a little bit further east, we're going to have bike lanes, everything fits. There's two blocks where things are very tight for everything to fit. And it's, um, I think it's like in the block, the fifth block in the fourth block of Walnut. So like fourth to fifth, and then third to fourth is where it gets really tight. And in these blocks, we've talked to um, faith leaders in the corridor who have churches along there. We've talked to town staff who has parking there. We've, we've put out a lot of ideas and we've considered many. Um, we've considered um, what happens if we do some um, angled parking with like a shared lane configuration? What if we did back in angled parking along here? Some communities are trying that. What if we did um, put the parking in the center of the road and move the travel lanes outside of the road? Uh, what happens if we move the curbs and we made more space for all this? And, and the solution that um, we've, we've arrived at that we're going to ask for input on and we're going to um, take that input tonight and other things and bring them to town board is to transfer some of the angled parking over to parallel parking and, um, and then put in the bike lanes that are consistent through most of the corridor. So I'm showing you an example of one block here where this, this would apply. And, and the good news is most of the corridor just has this parallel parking, meaning you're parking parallel against the curb. So there's plenty of space to fit in these bike lanes. But for these two blocks here, there's angled parking. And, he's, and I'm gonna draw this here. As you can see in the angle, or maybe Alicia can draw it for me. In the angled parking, the, the ends of the butts of the car stick in the road, another 10, 
to five to 10 feet, depending on the vehicle. So it eats up some more space. And so we can't fit the bike lanes in and keep the travel lanes there. So what we're proposing to do is take that angled parking and turn it so that it becomes parallel parking. And the good news is it's not on both sides. It's only on one side in this block, at least where we do this. So um, I wanna show you why we're doing that next. So can you go to the photos? So our, this team, members of this team have been part of two projects where we've actually taken out bike lanes that live behind the rear ends of cars because it's really difficult, high crash bike lane parking. So if you can imagine that's your Subaru, you have to literally turn your head, look back through the, the car seats and the back cargo area of your car when you back out to make sure no one's coming, including the bikes. And most of the times with a bike lane there, you're pulling out so you get enough visual so you can see the car, the traffic, and you're pulling into the bike zone. So that's not so great. And so we have two projects in our last seven year history where I actually took bike lanes out because it was configured like this. Can you go to the next picture? And then the other challenge of having angled parking near a bike lane is even when you have a Honda Civic next to not a very large SUV called a RAV4 in this case, you have to inch out. Once again, you're looking through the back part, the passenger rear window, and you're, you're looking at basically the taillight of that RAV4, right? So you're inching out back, back, back into the bike lane to kind of make sure you're not hitting a car. So it's really unsafe to put bike lanes next to parallel parking or sorry, angle parking, right? And so those are the examples there that really drive it home. So we have this conundrum of you have angle parking. We fully understand and have heard how precious every parking space is down there. The need is something that we're very um, sympathetic to and understand. And we want to try to find this balance, right? Because our job as well is to provide safety for people who are going to be down there riding in addition to being respectful of the parking, right? So go to the next slide. So, so what does that mean? Well, it means that um, there are, there's going to be some parking loss if we do this. So um, what we tried to do as a team is um, try to find the safest design possible with the least crash potential. And if we do that with this design, which is converting the parallel parking, the angled parking to parallel parking, it means on those two blocks, we lose about 15 parking spaces. And once again, we understand that is gonna feel like a lot and every space is precious, but we, we really wanna to try to promote and propose this design with a safety aspect. Um, if we do this design, it allows us to construct these two blocks and the rest of the project within budget and this summer. It allows the design to be consistent. So people who are riding bikes up, like so say you were on the Poudre River Trail and you wanted to go to downtown and have a beer, or listen to music or buy a book or buy a chainsaw, you could ride your bike up 7th Street and then hit the Walnut Bikeway and then get all the way to Walnut and you'd be a block off from the hardware store to do that. And you'd be riding in the same type of bike facility the whole way. So the idea is there's consistency. In addition, people who are driving who are like getting used to what's going on here see the same thing the whole time, right? And so the consistency is critical. So that's why we're trying to keep them all the same. Um, these 15 parking spaces in the two blocks there is the potential to add them back in within a block or two. We wanna be sensitive though of the residents who live maybe a block or two south that maybe they're gonna end up with angle parking in front of their house. So I don't wanna presume that those 15 can automatically add, add in. We'd have to talk to them, but there's the ability in the network another block or two south to add these. And then finally, making this change this summer uh, would allow the patterns and parking to kind of come back to life again, because post COVID, right, there's going to be a lot of new activity going on down there, but there's nothing like going on right now. And in fact, the town's parking study is on hold until maybe next spring, or at least when things come back to life. So the idea would be that a project like this, that was about safety and bikes could be installed and then understood in the context of this larger area when the downtown plan comes moving along. So I wanna just make sure that you understand that the staff and the team here, we, we, it was, it was been a gut wrenching. These two blocks of the 1.7 miles have been gut wrenching. We really have been trying 
to be aware and mindful of the role of parking in here and, 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 the, and the critical need that exists. So I, I wanna make sure you know we, we get that, but we also have to balance this other side with, we gotta have a design that's safe because the whole goal is to get people riding and walk, riding and walking really in this area uh, to experience downtown, right? That's the goal of the TMP, that's why we're doing it. And then the last point that's probably worth is spinning around in your head is, well, couldn't we do this on another block, right? And we already, as Paul said earlier, we already decided that Main Street, like if you go to Main Street between say fifth and second, there's a lot of angled parking there already. So, and there's trucks and that angled parking on Main Street come in, in and out a lot. People turn over in that parking lot, right? And so there's was way more impacts to parking and the ability to add a safe bike lane on Main Street. So we, during the TMP said we should go to Walnut, right? And so now we're at Walnut and we, we've got most of it solved in a really effective way, we think, but we're down to like these 15 parking space transitions. So I, I know that it's gonna seem like, you know, it's a game of inches now, but we really have been trying to minimize that. So that's the story, that's the transparency. We're not holding anything back on that. We wanted to be upfront about all these things. Um, what I think we could do next is I see something, some questions coming up in the chat. And if you were not absorbing, paying attention, thank you, that's so appreciated. If you wanted to start asking some questions in chat or you want us to address some of those things, we will. We have about 10 or 15 minutes where we can kind of respond to chat and talk through that. And then I'm gonna ask you some polling questions. I wanna leave a little bit of time after those polling questions because it may get some ideas going again to get your input. And then we'll, we'll kind of see, we, um, see where we are. So um, let's go to the chat first. Okay, so um, Carlos, the first question that I see is about um, the advisory bike lanes. Um, and a comparison with those two, I'm gonna go back to that slide. Thank you, yes, good. Do it a better way. A comparison with those to the, um, Oh, it's even pulling. All right, we'll find it. Um, a comparison with those to a bicycle facility on Stone Mountain near the STEM school. And I'm curious, I'd, I'd like to hear more about that if you can put it in the chat because the, the ones that I see on, on Stone Mountain currently, and I'm trying to remember from driving by there recently, um, I think are more like conventional bike lanes with a center line, um, almost a little bit more like the, the, the Walnut and Sevens type facilities. Um, advisory bike lanes are ones that are designed so that you know, the middle area here isn't as wide as a street typically is. And so they're designed so that those cars go over the dashed lines. And I know at the STEM school, you're probably trying to make sure they don't go over the dashed lines so that it stays clear for bikes and it stays clear for those folks who are pulling over to park. Um, but I'd, I'd like to hear more about that or if any of the rest of the, the team here um, uh, knows additional info on those ones. So I, I believe those are just traditional bike lanes. And the, the difference here is, like we said, we don't have the width to stripe that in. And, and so that's, that's the difference. And, and what's shown in this diagram is almost kind of like um, a scenario that could present itself but it, it will rarely present itself. And so um, cars passing each other when there's also a bike present, right? And so it's like two cars have met and they're gonna need, like let's say that right tire goes over and at the same time, there's someone riding. And then that's where people kind of slow down and yield and hopefully they're driving the posted limit. In most situations, when people are driving, they're, they're driving in a zone, which kind of is almost like a shared lane. Like if you think about the streets in um, old neighborhoods in Denver, where the streets, like you almost have to pass each other because the parking, because it's tight. Well, fortunately we have enough width where that doesn't happen. But when you pass somebody here, you have to get that tire in, in the effective bike lane, right? So there's, there's, this is really different than a bike lane design, but it allows us to keep the parking. Mm -hmm. And this is a photo on the right that I didn't point out when I was on this slide, but a photo on the right is of the advisory bike lanes and how they would work. That car would drive in the middle 
until they saw he pulled over because he wanted to get a little extra space for the bicycle going the opposite direction. Great. So Alicia, there's a question about um, the ADA parking requirement. And so um, with the parallel spaces that go in, that get converted, we can maintain ADA on, on at the head of each block face consistent with what we have now, right? So it's not, we're not suggesting that we're gonna pull ADA out to do this. Right, there, ADA parking in a downtown area is a little bit, is pretty nuanced to start with. Um, the, the, the person asking the question very aptly asked, you know, is this satisfy the ADA requirements per building? And in a downtown area, it's, it's more of a um, general block looking at it as an overall supply rather than specifically for each building. And of course, most of these buildings have angled parking that has that a little bit easier ADA design uh, access off of those angled. And you can design parallel parking spaces to be ADA as well if those were, were needed there. Okay, so our goal is to maintain the ADA supply that we have. It'll just become parallel, not angled. Yep, or shift. Paul, do you, do you know about the parade route and does the parade route, um, so, so the question, there's a question I brought up about what effect will this all have on the, the parade route? Does the, the parade route go down Walnut? No, I think it just goes uh, down 7th unless I'm mistaken. Yeah. So I, I assume the question was um, at 7th and Walnut. Great question. Yeah, I think it turns at 7th and Walnut, right? Yeah, west on Walnut and then down 7th goes down Walnut and then west on 7th. Okay, so um, so it goes west on Walnut and yeah. down on 7th. Okay, so Alicia, can you put up your diverter, di the 7th and Walnut diagram again? Yes. <clears throat> okay, cool. Thank you, Sammy, for asking that question. So we're, let's pull up the visual for a second. So the parade, can you get your red pen out? So the parade goes, west on Walnut, and then it goes down on 7th. Correct, okay. And then during the parade, there's police that shut off this route, meaning that motor vehicles are not allowed to get into this area, right? So theoretically, there's a, so Alicia, draw a barrier that close off the north leg of the intersection in red, right? So, so there's police control there, right? So um, so can you erase and draw? So the, since the road is closed and vehicles need to navigate this turn, trailers and trucks, they would, they would make the turn, they could make the turn in the south, in the northbound lane. So yes. right, yes. they could yeah. do that, right? They could also do it from, and that would probably be when you're like a trailer or what you're pulling, that would probably be the most direct route to do that. So the way that this is configured, you can't typically and legally make that movement. And if you tried to do it, I guess you could, you'd have to be a really aggressive driver and make that <laughs> movement, but you could probably do it. But when the, can you do the block off? When the police have this blocked off for the parade, they basically close off the north legs of the intersection. That, that I'll line that Alicia drew on the bottom is the way that vehicles could go west on Walnut in south on 7th. But once again, it's only really allowed when there's police control for the parade. So, so that's possible. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't change the parade route because that turn can be made with traffic control. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, there's another one. Do you have any plans to keep truck traffic turning east off of 257 off of Walnut? Steve, can you take that one? Yeah, I'm trying to, um, just so I understand that question about the route there, I know that uh, turning east off 257 off Walnut, I'm not quite sure I understand the pattern being described there. I think, I think maybe they're saying keep turning west. I think it's like trucks coming off at 257, making left-hand turns using Walnut to go west. I think that's the question, Liz. Yeah, I don't know if the if the, the town's done anything to address that. I know, I, I believe it's... Um, you know, Mark now has a truck, truck route, but maybe Paul can clarify that if he knows. Is this the... Yeah, Walnut does not allow um, like semi-trucks um, 
except for you know that portion down by the the lumber mill i know that the trucks use that area so um but they shouldn't be traveling through kind of the downtown area can you zoom in Alicia? we did we did get some some truck data yeah and there were um on that section right there um you know we did our accounts and there were about 1500 cars a day and there were 13 heavy trucks during the day uh, i'm not sure what time this came through it's about one percent heavy trucks and then by the time you got um close to town hall it was about uh there were, there were about half that um so i'm not quite sure you know some of those are probably going in there but but there were you know six heavy trucks in the day that was counted on the average um you know kind of in front of town hall and, and that would be like a, a semi-trailer type truck okay so there and then Liz, maybe you're talking about trucks like not just semis, but other trucks like beer delivery trucks. I know the mail delivery truck has come up a couple of times in the routing for that. And so um, to answer your question about that, depending when we can all kind of maybe agree or disagree on the number of trucks and the type of trucks, but the there's nothing in this project that's going to go down to 257 and say trucks, you are not allowed, right? This project is um, the funding for this project is about how do we add, incorporate bikes east-west into Walnut and do that in a safe way. And so that's, if that's something else that you wanted to tell us more about and you want the town to take up other requests about that, clearly we will put that in the record and pass it on. Uh, but the bike piece is the big one we're going down now. Um, so there's questions about kind of the advisory bike lane and about people getting confused with that. And like, is that, they're driving in it and like, so the question is saying, can you maybe use different colors, Alicia, to help drivers distinguish between what the bike lane is and what the travel lane is. And so if they're moving over into that green zone, they're kind of being more aware. So the question is, can you, can you do that different coloring? You can, it's, it's, it definitely doesn't usually go with an advisory bike lane to have separate colors there. Um, there are a few different reasons um, but I have seen them with different colors, um, particularly in, I'm not sure, I'm trying to remember if I've seen another color in the United States, but I have seen in other countries. Um, and one of the big concerns is maintenance that it pretty quickly gets worn off, but certainly something we can talk about with town staff. Okay, so Lee, we hear that, we hear the kind of the concern about like distinguishing that zone, making it defensible. And and I, I think we're adding to the record here kind of this notion of could we use some color in the area. So maybe it's not the whole thing, but could we use some more green? So we're hearing that. Yeah, you would do. The, the ones that I've seen have had um, red, but in the United States, it would be green in the bike lane here because it almost provides more bounds on that, you know, vehicular lane in the middle. Right. Can you go back to the, um, the next question is going to be about parking between the fifth and sixth blocks. So can you go to the next slide? Yeah. The question is, does the that parking one. between fifth and sixth go away? In addition to the parking between third and fourth, is it 15 spaces lost between both blocks? So this is fifth to sixth. Uh, and this is third to fourth. And the diagonal parking on the north side between third and fourth goes away. The diagonal parking on the south side between fifth and sixth goes away. And the total between those two blocks is 15 spaces lost. Okay, so this this one right here, what block is this that we're seeing? This is third to fourth. Third to fourth. So, um, so Cameron, third to fourth on the north side, that angled parking becomes parallel. We're able to keep, spaces. excuse me? You lose eight spaces on this block yeah. face. Great, thank you. Yeah, so eight faces, eight spaces here are the result of that change. We're able to keep parking in, in front of town hall but we're proposing that as angled back end parking. So we're, the reason why we didn't lose like everything on this block is there's more space. You can see this bump out. Can you draw? Yeah, the town actually has like a little bump out out of the sidewalk zone. And that's how they got, that's why we can keep that angled back end parking in front of the bike lanes there. That's not regular head in angled parking. That's in back end angled parking. So we're able to keep that there. Okay, so in this block, the big transitions on the north side, and that was eight spaces. And then Alicia, can you go to the other block? And then Alicia, remind what what number is this block? Seven. Oh, yeah. what number? 
This is yeah. fifth to sixth. Okay, so this is the fifth to sixth block. And then the transitions on the south side on this block. So the south side, you can see it's going from angled to parallel. And the change here is seven spaces. Mm -hmm. Right, so these two blocks, that net, net transition out is gonna be a, a negative 15, right? But it's eight on one block and seven on the other. So that's how the math works for those. And it's just those two blocks because there's angled parking on those sides. And then there's a note in the comment um, from town engineering staff, thanks, that Walnut Street west of Chimney Park Drive restricts trucks larger than 45 feet long. So um, theoretically and by law, trucks that are 45 feet long should not be on Walnut Street west of Chimney Park Drive. So in 45 foot long trucks, those are the ones that typically like have a, a tractor pulling them. And then there's, there's like a double axle at the end trailer, right? And so those longer vehicles should not be um, on Walnut Street. Okay, another question from Cameron. Are you going to put parallel parking in front of the homes between fourth and fifth? So do we have the fourth and fifth block up here? Yeah. Um, this is fourth and fifth and there is parallel parking there today, right? Did I get that right? Yeah. Let's go in there. Yep. Yeah. So, Alicia, you want to talk through this block? This is fourth to fifth. Yeah. So this this block looks like a um, a typical buffered bike lane. The existing parallel parking here remains, and effectively, uh, <laughs> luckily, this road is just wide enough to be able to stripe in a bike lane, a buffered bike lane, without removing any of the parking where there's parallel parking. Great, so, that, so that's gonna exist. So that camera, that parking won't change. Um, Liz, I hear you. We're gonna convey this to town board as well. The notion that we, the residents have asked for more enforcement of those trucks in that corridor. And, um, and I also heard, we talked to town engineering staff about this, about getting some more video data and some more traffic count data in this area. Um, so we have on the list, to do more collection of the trucks and the volume of these, and particularly maybe as things get, get going again, I don't know if they're, the COVID levels are down or up. You could probably tell us more. I know you live along there, uh, but, but we will pass on the notion that there may be um, some naughty or maybe, um, maybe not informed folks who are driving trucks through the zone that need to um, be just reminded that it's not really allowed. So, we will convey that to town board. It's obviously part of this record now um, as part of the conversation that we're having. You got it. Lee, uh, bikes going, so Alicia, this one's probably for you again. Bikes going east-west on Walnut often will cross Maine to get to Windsor Lake facilities or concerts, or recreation, all that good stuff going on up there. Uh, do the plans seek to funnel us to specific crossings other than seventh or just use all the crossings? What do you think, Alicia? That's a really good question. Um, we're trying to make seventh much more comfortable to cross for those people who need a little bit more comfortable crossing. It certainly doesn't preclude you to cross at some of the other locations if that's where you're comfortable. Um, if Lee, you obviously ha have experience bicycling around here. If there is another very obvious route that people that bicyclists often cross at, you know, then let us know. So Alicia, can you just draw that in? So like, just so people visually can see that because that would help me too. I'm a visual person. So yeah. Like, so, yeah. so a lot of the time, you know, if you're, if you're in here somewhere and you're, for instance, I, you're me with my kid on a strider, I'll probably go over here, particularly if the multi-use path on seventh, you know, ends up being implemented and go up seventh to get over to, you know, where, wherever you're going at Windsor Lake. Um, but if you're, if you're along here and you usually cross at fifth or you usually cross at one of these other, there's nothing that that's going to not allow you to. So can you leave that up for a second? Cause I know Liz, you, you've talked about this too. And we had a great um, COVID safe conversation outside when we were putting up signs, Paul and I did about that fifth crossing and people, neighborhood residents want to walk up to the lake and some more traffic control at fifth and main. And uh, that road, is controlled by CDOT. They get to decide what happens there in terms of traffic control. And we're opening up um, a great conversation with CDOT. There are some new folks there that we're working with. 
and um, that corridor and the next one over are part of conversations about um, traffic calming and pedestrian crossings. And I can tell you that we don't have an exact design for that, or we have a recommendation for that because we're not working in that corridor yet, but we, we've been conveying those conversations with their staff. And so when you're telling us these things, they're, they're getting moved into the CDOT realm. Uh, and, and I wish we could do more than that right now, but I think we're beginning that conversation with them. So um, more to come hopefully there. Carlos Omar mentions also in the chat that there's to what you say are speaking about um, engineering plans to study that connection along fifth from. Okay. All right, Walmart. so engineering staff has it in the queue to learn more and figure out more about that. And we're, we're hopefully gonna have a really great conversation with CDOT about the balance between people who wanna get up, make that connection in, in the traffic, right? Um, so next one is traffic volume. It's been increasing on Walnut the past few years, probably because of congestion on Maine. Yeah, so a question about like yep. the burden, right? Yeah, I've seen a lot of that. Just in my observations when I've been out there, you know, you can see people that look ahead as they're going northbound on 7th and they look ahead to Maine and I'm gonna turn on Walnut. You know, they kind of kind of judge it. So it's definitely some some redistribution of um, volumes going on there, I think, due to the congestion. Steve, do you, this uh, is more of a psychological traffic question than maybe an engineering one, So, but you're good at these. Do you think that would change because now you can't get, you can't drive through Walnut? So this notion of like staying on Main Street because we, we were, were kind of for safety reasons not allowing the through? Yeah, I, I, for sure. I think that some of the traffic that's going east-west across Walnut, I mean, across 7th at Walnut in the peak hours is, is avoiding Maine. Um, and, but, but the volume is, you know, it's 20 to 30 vehicles an hour. It's not a, not a huge volume, but during the peak hour, probably a lot of the traffic that is on Walnut is, are people that would otherwise maybe be on another street like Maine. Yeah. Okay, we've quickly moved into another quarter, which I, I, is telling me that it's time to ask some polling questions. And so um, we, by design, around eight o'clock, right? And so thank you for being, thank you sh for sharing an hour with us. Like time is a precious thing. And we can't thank you enough for, for doing this. Some of you too did two nights with us, so thanks. We're gonna ask you some polling questions. And then Paul, I'm gonna ask you maybe to give kind of a next steps. And then if there are other questions that prompt for that, we can spend a little more time going through those. So um, Alicia, do you mind launching? Yeah. Design the, polling? Design. Yeah, there to be one question. Yeah, yeah, you can launch that one. Okay, so we have a question for you here, given the whole enchilada that we just presented to you here. Um, what do you think about the recommended design for Walnut? It looks reasonable, which means we should keep going, tell town board we wanna move ahead and keep designing. Do you think we should make some um, small changes? And if you think we should, we wanna hear about those in the chat. So if there's something that you wanna see tweaked, like I know Lee brought up the idea of some green instituted with the advisory bike lanes, that would be a great thing to just reinforce. And Lee, you don't have to add that one, we got that one, but there's an example. If you think we should choose another design at this point, this is still the time where maybe you could tell us that, you know, we haven't spent the engineering money. The way this process is designed is to engage the community three meaningful points before we spend the engineering money and, and we, we haven't yet. And so if you think there's another design or you feel strongly about that, let us know. Or if you're not sure, that's okay too. So why don't you um, poll and then Alicia will give in a little bit, maybe 10, 15 more seconds and then we can close and see where we are. Yep. Got a few more votes in here. Okay. Okay. So um, those of you who are thinking small changes, we'd love to hear about those and hear about the tweaks where you think would make sense to do that. Those of you who think it's reasonable, it's also really helpful. Town board loves hearing, you know, like why it's reasonable and, and why the decisions that we've empowered them to make as leaders are, are the might right ones to make, right? And then if you're not sure, um, the person who's in that camp, if, if you feel comfortable, if you wanna let us know, like what else would you like to know? That's fine too. So Paul, maybe you could do a, a, a just a review of the next steps. So those who wanted to, um, Sign off after an hour could, and then anybody who wants to stick around would probably do another five, 10 minutes. 
Sure. So first of all, thanks everyone for joining us tonight and giving us your, your feedback. It's been really great getting your comments and thoughts. Um, so this is the third and probably last meeting uh, um, using this format with the community. Um, we will be going to town board for a work session on January 25th. So uh, it's in two weeks, Monday night. Um, feel free to tune into that if you wanna see a similar presentation and, and see town board's thoughts and hopefully we'll get their blessing to, to move forward with uh, one of these designs. And we will be posting this meeting, as I mentioned earlier, on the windsorprojectconnect.com website um, so if you want to check it out or refer friends or neighbors to, to check it out, please do that. And then if all goes according to plan, we will, you'll start to see some changes this summer in, in the corridor. So I guess with that, we can do any more question and answer that. Yep. So um, one that came in from Barbara. So those of you who want to keep going, that's great. Those of you who have been here since the beginning, um, thanks for being here. So um, are there reasonable options to avoid the advisory lanes um, and opening doors? Is, is, is all the parking in the west section of Walnut? So Alicia, can you go back to that west section? <clears throat> so, um, the advisory bike lane design, the, um, so, so this question is, Hey, so are there, you know, people who may be merging into that lane at times, can, can, is there a way to avoid that? And, and there is right. It would be removing on-street parking in front of a, a lot of residences and, um, not all the houses along Walnut in this section, front Walnut. Like some are side, like in this picture here, you can see like some houses, their side of the house is there. So they have on street parking on the street that is on the other side. But there are a lot of houses like on the south end here, right, that have, that's their parking out front of their house. So you'd be talking about a pretty significant removal of parking to do that. So that's why this design kind of balances the needs of everybody and the volumes are at a place like Alicia said a few times that kind of makes sense of that. So, so the answer to that is, if, if you decide that reasonable taking away parking in front of their house is reasonable, then sure. Yes, you could do that. But we've kind of determined that the amount of parking that would be removed out of this would be not um, reasonable. Next question. Um, so Dave, Beth, Dave from Bethel. Hey, Dave. Um, questions about the changes in front of the church. You gave some ideas uh, and come up with others. So Dave, I get the impression that maybe you weren't here for the conversation that we had about the parking, maybe you joined late. Can you let us know in the chat if you did so that I don't reiterate anything that, um, <laughs> that, that maybe you've heard? And if you did hear it, then I wanna maybe respond in a different way. So can you just let us know if you just got here a little while ago and you didn't hear the part uh, and we'll do it again, uh, but just let us know that. So we'll, we'll come back to that one. Paul, there's a question about what time is the town board meeting on and is it on TV? Yes, it's 5.30 start time, and it's on TV and uh, streamed online. Right, okay. Um, Lee has a change. White advisory bike lanes, green for dedicated. Maybe look at the crossing to Windsor Lake at the east end of the lake from Walnut. Alicia, did you see that one? Yep, and I think that that was just reiterating the, the comments that we discussed earlier, so good things to, to note and discuss. Okay. Okay. All right, and then just some comments about thanks for the input and the ability. Okay, so good. All right, so um, let's go back. So um, let's, we'll just do this one more time for the, um, uh, the design section for the parking in front of the church. So can you go to the next slide? Okay, so- um, Here's the church. Can you go to that one? Yeah, actually, can you go back to, sorry. Okay, so we looked at a variety of options, right? We looked at angled park. Okay, can you erase the circles? There you go, cool. All oh. right, so we, we looked at a variety of options, Pastor Dave, the ones that you've given to us, and then 
several others, right? We've looked at um, angled parking with doing a shared lane. We've looked at back end angled parking. We've looked at the idea where you had center parking in the middle. And then we've talked about moving the curbs to accommodate everything in this zone. And what we've determined is that um, converting certain sections that are angled parking into parallel parking would be a way to um, get the project built within the budget that's available and also be the safest design and also have the least amount of parking lost in the corridor. So um, why we did that, now I'll let you go to the next slide, is because angled parking, sorry, can you go to the pictures? Sorry, I meant- Okay, yep. yeah. Uh, angled parking is not great behind a bike lane. I think you've acknowledged that before we've had others, like when you're trying to back out, you're looking through your passenger uh, rear window or you're looking through a car seat or your dog in the back and it's hard to see what's going on. Next slide. So we've been part of projects that have actually taken out bike lanes behind angled parking. Like in this picture, if you're in this Honda, even when there's a RAV4 parked next to you, it's very difficult to see um, car, cars coming, let alone bikes. And usually what happens is the cars back out, they back out into that zone and they're not hitting a car, but they're occupying the space where people are riding and it's not very predictable. So, um, so we, we don't wanna do a design that's unsafe, obviously, nor does anybody. So that means we can't put the bike lanes next to angled parking. So when you get to that one, then go to the next one. So then what we did is we said, okay, what happens if we transition um, angled parking to parallel? Well, it's a safer design, it's the least crash potential. And if we only do it on two blocks where we have this problem, the net loss for two blocks is 15 spaces. So one block, this block here, the net loss would be seven. And this is the block between third and fourth. So there'd be seven less parking spaces. And then on the block between fifth and sixth, there would be eight fewer spaces. And that trade-off would allow us to construct it within the budget. It would allow us to go out and do this project this summer. It would create a design that's safe with all the other bike lanes in the area. And then we did say here that there's a possibility to add parking back in on a block or two south so that these um, seven spaces as an example on this block could be added on the side street. So it could be added on the third or fourth or maybe a block south on Elm. But we don't wanna just say that it can happen because we need to talk to those residents in that area too, right? Because people that have parallel in front of their house may have angled parking and now people are angled parking straight in and putting their headlights right into their windows, right? As opposed to parallel where that doesn't really happen. So we think there's a possibility to add that parking back in, but we don't wanna just go on and, and say yes right now. And then if we make this change with the bike lanes, meaning we would go from parallel from angled to parallel, it could be part of um, the demand study that's on hold now, but coming up that will make recommendations for the larger area. So this notion of, well, can't we just put the seven stasis further south? Well, we could, but there's a bigger study that's going on that's looking at more comprehensive solutions. So we don't wanna, because that study's on hold, we don't wanna just like add things back in there without the context of everybody else, right? So we, 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 looked at all these designs. We understand that every parking space is precious and value and we get it. And we're, we, we've struggled with this decision. It's been really heartbreaking for us not to be able to find one that can keep every parking space out there. But, but in the end, we have to make sure that this design um, is the safe for everybody who's doing it. So we were hoping that this change in the seven spaces on this block and eight on the others would be an acceptable medium uh, that could hopefully get back, those spaces could hopefully get back in with the parking study. So that's where we are on it. That's what we did uh, for the larger group conversation. And that, that's feedback here tonight. Like if you wanna tell us more about that, that's what we're here to do. But um, we're gonna include all of these comments to town board. And like our, our role here is to present what we think is the safest option to town board and town board's role is to tell us kind of what to do moving ahead, right? And so um, so that's where we are with the, with the design. And so we'll go back to the chat. Alicia and Steve, maybe you can help me out. Is there anything that came in the chat and this feedback when I was talking that you could fill in? Nope, got it all. And then Pastor Dave just 
texted or uh, chatted again here, um, kind of following up on his, but that's. Yeah, I, I wish this was. His easy. concern is less Sunday mornings and more about the, the overall downtown use. One thing that was mentioned to illustrate that was good, Pastor Avion, there was a question about ADA parking and like parking for um, folks who kind of have some mobility challenges that maybe need to get in and out. And our goal, our, our responsibility and our goal is to not lose those ADA spaces, particularly kind of like at these corners and I think where there's curb ramps and access to maybe some of the churches. So although we're going from angled to parallel, we don't want to lose those ADA spaces. So we're going to try to keep, we're going to keep as many of those that exist in that configuration. So I, I don't know if that's a concern for yours and other people who um, use that, but we're, it came up in this conversation. I want to just make sure you heard that as well. So yeah, now, I, I saw there were comments uh, from Karen, um, just that there may be some ideas that we haven't considered, although it sounded like she did, wasn't here at the beginning. Um, and so certainly we would encourage, like we would love to hear um, hear the ideas that you have and, and maybe just something that we that we did consider, but we'd um, love to talk about it. Um, so we definitely want to get your comments. Okay. So and that was yesterday. And that's Dave. So Karen's Dave. <laughs> so, uh, so Sorry. Paul, why don't we plan to follow up um, before town board one more time, just to make sure that we understand if there's some other option out there that we haven't looked at, we can, we can take it again. Um, and so let's plan on doing that. All right, so one more here that just came in. I'm concerned about parking at night from the restaurants in the area. Okay, so um, great question. Probably part of the parking study that's on hold about kind of the role of parking and other things. I know we're reconfiguring, you know, certain spaces here, but the, once again, this, and then there's a website, Town's website um, has uh, a lot of this information about the parking study. It is on hold, like I've said a few times, but they're going to, take that issue head on. Obviously they're on hold now because trying to study parking is not, this is not the time to do it right now. Uh, and so they're waiting until um, the world comes back to life in order for that to happen. Okay. So Paul, do you wanna do one more wrap up just for anybody who may have joined a little late and then we'll let you do the sign off. Yeah, so again, we'll be at town board January 25th. That's, we'll be on TV. Um, it's a work session, starts at 5.30. Um, so welcome you to, to watch that. Um, continue to, to follow on the windsorprojectconnect.com and these meetings will be posted there for, um, for your reference. And you know if you have other comments, um, my email is on that, on the Windsor Project Connect website. Feel free to, to email me any uh, comments, thoughts, questions, suggestions, and we will follow up with you. So uh, I think with, with that, um, thanks everyone again for joining us and have a good night.